In the world of Freerun, most people who set out on quests, otherwise known as adventurers, are separated into different classes. Most commonly seen are warriors or priests, but the class we spend the most time with in Freerun is the mage. In the early days, magic was considered taboo, a creation born from demons, only capable of destruction. But after the great mage Flom, a famous adventurer set out on spreading the wonders and joy of magic, traveled the world, and shared her message, a new era emerged that allowed humanity to flourish in the knowledge of magic. 80 years after the defeat of the Demon King, brought about by the surge of magic in humans, Mages are a common occurrence in the world, with our story set in this time period of quote-unquote peace. Magic has lost a lot of its violent tendencies and allowed multiple different personalities and types of mages to enter the fray, truly diversifying the amount of power found in the mage class. Today we'll be going over every mage in Freerun, new and old, as long as they are relevant enough in the story, and ranking them from weakest to strongest, taking into account their magic type overall intelligence, experience level, and power. This will also be a deep character dive into each mage, so whether you're interested in the power scaling or just learning more about the characters, there's plenty in this video for everyone. So if you haven't already, hit that like button and subscribe if you want to continue to see videos like this in your feed. We're gonna get right into it with the first mage on this list, but most importantly, thank you for watching. A second class mage who participates in the first class mage exam. Edel specializes in hypnotism magic. These types of spells have run through her family for generations, and thus, Edel is able to draw exceptional power compared to the average hypnotist. Although this means she isn't a very combat-centric mage, Edel is able to manipulate another person just by eye contact and doesn't require physical touch whatsoever. Edel can't take over a being with no mind though, the magic's one fatal flaw. Because of this talent, and Edel is constantly enlisted for odd jobs by the Continental Magic Association, which she begrudgingly accepts, leading to her having a very cocky and demanding outlook on life, despite not even being able to pass the first class mage exam and having to escape from the second phase. She was hand chosen by Lernin, a much higher ranked mage and apprentice to Great Mage Siri, founder of the whole Continental Magic Association, to participate in a top secret mission to research one of the seven sages of destruction a top-level demon. Edel's hypnotism also comes with a secondary ability to read a person's memories, as this also tends to fall in the realm of quote-unquote mental magic. And even in this area, Edel's potential and expertise shines through, having the power to pull in and absorb over 100 years of memories in a single touch, as well as defying the normal laws of magic and somehow being able to read the memories of the demon her and Lernin were chasing. Despite the well-thought and accepted fact that humans and demons are too different to even try and decipher. Again, despite Edel not being a fighter, she showed little fear in a battle against a high-tier demon like Mach while at the same time showing no shame in escaping when she feels it necessary. The makings of an intelligent mage, and one that both Freerin and Denkin, two higher ranked mages, are more than happy to compliment. Lawfin is a second class mage who specializes her magic in extreme speeds. It seems she grew up in a mountain tribe located in the south end of the continent. Lawfin is introduced during the first class mage exam as a member of the 13th party with fellow mages Denkin and Richter, both ranked much higher than she is. The reason for being the second lowest ranked mage on the list is simply her inexperience, that Denkin specifically notes as being the sole reason they lose to Freerun in the first phase of the mage exam because she lacks the ability to make tough decisions. Her signature spell is Jilwer, which allows Lawfin to achieve extreme speeds to the point the eye can't even perceive how fast she moves. Lawfin can go from standing to peak speed with Jilwer within the blink of an eye, to the point she's even able to compete with higher class mages like Method and claim the fight was easy. Although, to be fair, it is a clone, and Lawfin was briefed on all of her weaknesses before starting. She was even fast enough to blink in and out of free runs sight, although she was unable to hide her presence completely while doing this. Lawfin doesn't have much time on the battlefield, clearly, resulting in her sitting down here for now until we see her do anything else extravagant. Kane is a third class mage looking to skip a rank and jump right to first class. In the mage exam, she is partied up with Freerin and Loween, her childhood friend, 
Kane studied at the Academy of Magic with Loween, and thanks to Loween's friendship and praise, has learned to trust her abilities and grow into a much stronger and confident mage. Claiming to require praise, Loween acts as a support beam for Kane, being the one to push her off the ledge, figuratively and literally, forcing her to become her best self. This is something she struggles with often, and she may even lean on Loween a bit too much. Considering when she's ambushed by a monster, she calls out for Loween once her staff is knocked away and she can't defend herself. Kane's element of choice is water magic, and while extremely powerful, something that even a veteran like Freerin admits, it does come with its downsides. Kane is unable to use the peak of her magic without a large body of water or rain present to provide her with enough resources. This is what initially leads Kane and Loween to be defeated by Richter during the first phase of the mage exam, but once Freerin shatters the barrier and allows rain to enter the area, the tables immediately turn, as not only is Kane able to fight back now, now. She's able to muster so much power, she makes Richter eat his own words about overwhelming power and straight up dismantles him and his defense magic with one large maximum output spell. That spell is called Riemstroha, plain old water manipulation magic. Again, although the strength and attack power Kane can muster is massive, because it is entirely situational and she requires such a large amount of water to actually reach this level, Kane can't be ranked solely on this feat alone. Other major weaknesses also rise when you consider her worst matchup in the second phase of the exam is Loween's clone, proving that if Kane is ever up against a mage that can also manipulate water, in Loween's case, turning it into ice, she is again made completely defenseless. Keeping her so low on this list, despite the colossal strength Kane can dish out in very specific instances. This is why even though a mage like Richter would be her easiest opponent, in overall magical ability and battle skills, a character like him would obviously rank higher. The Great Mage Siri calculates this is due to Kane's mindset holding her back as she cannot visualize getting stronger or becoming a first-class mage to begin with, which directly contradicts the core concept of magic. If you can't visualize it, it can't happen. A previous student of the Academy of Magic and a third-class mage, Loween is one of Freerun's party members during the first-class mage exam. As most modern mages tend to specialize in the physical elements around them, Loween chose ice as her magic of choice. She takes the first class mage exam with her longtime old friend Kane, another third class mage that she grew up and studied with at the academy. The two tend to bicker and goof around often. Loween was the one who forced Kane to face her fears and learn flight magic, despite being too scared to take the leap. To be a little bit more specific, Loween kicked Kane off a cliff so survival instincts had no choice but to kick in, but I digress. Although she is only a third class mage, Loween is able to manipulate ice at an expert level. She also seems to be able to conjure ice out of thin air, although that level of ice is completely determined by the amount of mana used in the attack. At Loween's peak, she can use the spell Arrows of Ice, Neftir, to conjure massive spears of ice that can rocket at a target and pierce their flesh. And with an actual body of water available, she can flash freeze liquid in moments. However, as Richter does display in their fight, Loween's ice magic lacks lethality and any critical hit potential. This is mostly due to her inexperience and low mana count, but I'm sure with more time and a friend like Kane, Loween will continue to grow and develop into a worthy first class mage someday. Sharf is a second class mage and assumed to be entirely self-taught, despite his high skill in magical combat. Placed in a party with Wurbel, captain of the Northern Magic Corps, and Air. It is undeniably impressive Sharf has made it to second class all on his own merit. Although it leaves clear opening in his fight style due to having no understanding of the fundamentals. Sharf's signature spell is called Jubilade, and it involves turning basic flower petals into full-on steel, conjuring them in such a way they become sharp blades that can cut a person open. Sharf has trained long and hard in combat situations, and is easily able to wound another higher-ranked mage named Land in the first 
first phase of the mage exam, completely slicing through Lan's defense barriers. Sharf conveniently always carries a bouquet of flowers around with him, so he has plenty of stock. This is where Sharf's lack of all-around development rears its head, though, as the mage doesn't have much skill in mana detection or the intelligence not to fall into an illusionary trap. This is what causes him to instantly fall prey to land in their short scuffle. Although Sharf does redeem himself in the second phase of the mage exam, having to take on a clone of Whirbell and still comes out on top. Realistically, although the fight was off screen, this could mostly be due in part to Whirbell coaching Sharf on all of his weaknesses and the battle being a 3v3 as opposed to traditional 1v1. Either way, there is a clear reason why, when it came time to become first class, Siri passed Whirbell at a glance as opposed to Sharf. A second class mage and the granddaughter of Lernin, higher ranked mage and one of the great mage series best apprentices. Air was presumably trained by her grandfather in magic, specifically because she harkens back to fighting against Lernin while battling Fern in the first class mage exam. Although Fern claims Air might be the strongest mage out of their two respective parties, which considering that would make Air better than Werbel, Fern herself, and Yubel, that's a very bold statement to make. However, similar to someone like Kane, this could primarily be due to a mental handicap and Air not being able to visualize her true potential. As not only does Siri fail Air for not being able to visualize becoming a first class mage, Air also seems to acknowledge Fern's comment about her power level, acting as if she's already aware she should be stronger than she is. In battle against Fern, Air's signature spell is called Dorgat and revolves around manipulating rocks from around the area and converting them into bullets to fire at her opponents. This can easily be outpaced and dodged though, leading the biggest question to be what exactly Fern sees in Air, as not only is her offensive capability lacking, her defensive spells are easily crushed by Fern once the latter begins packing on multiple offensive spells at once. While Fern is an exceptionally powerful mage, it may also reflect on Air's unpolished battle IQ, as in Instead of thinking of a counter, the mage calls Fern's onslaught an undignified way to fight before just being crushed by all that weight. Fern's mana sense has never once been wrong though, implying Air does have untapped magical skill, which is easily assumed considering her relation to Lernin. And she is also able to defeat Sharf's clone during the second phase of the exam, but you can see by his low rank, that isn't too impressive of a feat. We look forward to Air's future in the story, and perhaps seeing just what it is Fern meant in that moment. But until then, she sits down here with the rest of the scrubs. A middle-aged bachelor who owns his own magical store in the city of Auburst. Richter is a second-class mage who partakes in the first-class mage exam. Although coming off very cold and ruthless, Richter does eventually open up to his party members Denkin and Lawfen after their constant harassment for friendship over the course of the exam. This seemingly heartless demeanor is something Richter carries in battle, as the man was even willing to murder Lewin and Kane, two young mages with plenty of future ahead of them in order to accomplish his goal of passing the exam. After much complaining from Denkin, Richter does choose to let the two girls live after their confrontation, but he makes sure to let them know at any point their lives could have been forfeit. Richter is a mage that specializes in earth-related magic, and with his high stock of mana, Richter is easily able to overwhelm most modern defense magic by simply stacking on too much force for the barrier to handle. It's with this method he's able to take on two mages that essentially have an elemental advantage over him, but this immediately switches up as soon as Kane gains access to water of course showing Richter isn't as thorough as he claims when up against his own methods. His signature spell is known as Balgron, Earth Control Magic, which allows him to manipulate the ground itself into large spikes or even create large plateaus by splitting parts of the Earth and rising or lowering its altitude. This does speak to how much control Richter does actually have over the battlefield, and it seems he specializes in magical tool repair as well, claiming there isn't a stave that exists he's incapable of fixing proving this by repairing Fern's staff after it was thought to be broken beyond repair. It's unknown what magic Richter calls upon for this skill, or if he can use it on more than just staves, 
but ultimately, his higher level of magical skill makes him a terrifying force to be reckoned with, and although he had no choice but to escape during the second phase of the first class exam, when you consider the opponent Richter ran away from was a clone of Sense, one of the proctors for the exam, and a much higher ranked mage on the list, it's an understandable decision to make. A world-famous warrior and captain of the Northern Magic Corps, Warbell is a middle-aged and highly experienced second-class mage who was one of the only few characters to be passed by the Great Mage Siri after the first-class exam. Having been born in one of the most dangerous parts of the Northern Continent, Warbell is no stranger to violence or danger. As a child, his village was one of those saved by the hero party that Freerun was a part of, who defeated the Demon King. Because of Himmel's bravery, and also having a childish dream to impress a girl he can't even remember the name of anymore, Werbel considered it his life's mission to become a strong hero and protect his home. A battle-hardened mage who has seen the worst parts of war, Werbel admits he's even had to kill women and children throughout some of his journeys. He's someone who sees magic as merely a tool to enact violence upon your enemies with, something that the Great Mage Siri appreciates and commends him for shortly before promoting him to first class. Despite this jaded approach to death and coming off as someone who Fern describes as one who would kick puppies, Warbell has forever been changed by Himmel the Hero and remains good-natured regardless of his rougher edges. As someone who understands people care more about their daily lives than worldwide calamities, Warbell doesn't shy away from helping the elderly or even carrying his teammates around when they're injured, knowing full well the effect Himmel the Hero's mundane activities had on his homeland. This also bleeds into Warbell's morals as well, as even though he's more than willing to take another's life, he does his best to shy away from senseless killing. Shown when Warbell is about to take Yubel's life, but chooses not to when Fern lies and says she killed his teammate. Knowing that a dead teammate means disqualification from the exam, and no longer having a reason to fight, Warbell chooses to surrender, even though, later on, he admits the world probably would have been a better place if he went through with murdering Yubel. Warbell indeed lives up to his name, and is a strong contender throughout the first class mage exam. Although we don't see much of his magic, Warbell's signature spell is known as Sorga Neil. It's a binding magic that activates once a person or object is completely inside of Warbell's vision. Once caught, a victim is unable to move or even access their mana to cast a counterattack. Sorganeal is impregnable, although it does have strict conditions. A trapped target must have their entire body inside of Warbell's sight, meaning if even an inch is outside of view, Sorganeal ceases immediately. Or against a fellow Sorganeal opponent, shown when Yubel fights her clone after copying the spell, and their entire scuffle surrounds who loses eye contact first. It's assumed through Warbell's reputation, he has access to more than just this one spell and a large stock of mana to go with it. Not only is he able to fight off Air's clone, a mage that Fern claims might be the strongest of their party, through teamwork with his two allies, Air and Sharf, Warbell is able to successfully fend off Denkin, a character who was one of the highest ranked mages on the list. Air also hints Warbell could defeat Fern due to them being a bad matchup. But this is highly doubtful, and we'll get into why later. Warbell is also shown taking odd jobs in between exam phases, battling demons and monsters that terrorize the area around Auburst, again showing his supposed skill in battle. Until we see more from him though, he's outclassed by some of these other mages just on account of less feats. Passing the first class exam, he also received a spell of his choosing from Siri, hopefully implying we will get to see more from Warbell. A first class mage and one of the proctors for the mage exam, Ganao is usually in charge of the first phase of the test and constantly argues with his fellow proctor sense on how grueling Ganao tends to make the first phase. The man shows little to no remorse for the countless dead participants that are always resulted from his exams, and justifies his callousness by saying if these people wanted to be first class mages, they should be more than ready for the dangers he subjects them to. Ganao is more than happy to allow mages with poor mana detection to die to monsters regional to the exam area, or allow the participants to slaughter each other if they see fit. 
He hides behind the simple rule of disqualification for a teammate's death, but Ganao is more than aware of the sinisterness in this. This stubbornness shows when Ganao refuses to believe Siri's barrier was broken, even when the act was performed right in front of him. He carries this cold and ruthless demeanor, even outside of proctoring exams as well, being someone who isn't even respectful enough to shake his subordinate's hand on his own, and needs to be commanded to do so. Ganao doesn't even show any kind of emotion for the loss of his hometown that was massacred by demons, or for the longtime partner he loses in the battle to protect it. The great mage Siri even calls Ganao an abominable man without a hint of kindness. This even goes as far to reach the point, without looking at him and just sensing the malice in his aura, one could mistakably perceive Ganao's presence as demonic. However, upon closer inspection, it would seem this killing intent isn't derived from pure evil. Rather, Ganao's distant personality seems to be a coping mechanism developed from years on the battlefield. Ganao believes that his longtime partner's death was due to his overkindness and being a good person, something that Ganao believes should have no place fighting in the Northern Plateau. His partner was killed attempting to defend a child in battle, something that Ganao admits he could never do, as he claims he's forsaken too many people already to care about trivial matters such as that. He doesn't consider himself to be a good person, and therefore perfect for the job of fighting demons. Ganao claims to enjoy the thrill of battle, and wonders why they don't pick more first-class mages like Yubel to fight with him. His demeanor ultimately makes this easy to believe, but Ganao is more valiant than he lets on. After the destruction of his hometown, Ganao works tirelessly to ensure every villager, dead or alive, is accounted for. He also goes above and beyond to care for the wounded, or even more respectably, inspiring hope in the fallen villagers even as they're on their deathbed. That killing intent I mentioned, that was almost demonic in nature, is conveniently felt as he plots his revenge against the demon Revolt who destroyed his village, leading one to believe he might take this mission a little bit more personally than he claims. Ganao also stays behind while the group goes to track the demons responsible in order to ensure the corpses of the villagers aren't defiled. During the fight against Divine Revolt, a former demon general and the monster responsible for taking out Ganao's hometown, the first class mage shows exceptional battle skill. Ganao is considerably adept at close quarters combat, keeping up with a top tier demon like Revolt who quadruple wields blades of shape shifting size and weight without taking any blows until caught off guard. Ganao performs better in the fight than Stark does to a degree, although that's most likely due to the added benefits of his magic. Ganao's signature spell is Degard Knocked, which allows him to conjure fully functional jet black wings on his back from Niello, a mixture of copper, silver, sulfur, and lead. Ganao can use these wings to fly and for increased mobility, but also as a shield to defend against powerful attacks or as a weapon to deal critical slash attacks. He's also pretty adept at defense and barrier magic, considering he claims his new barrier over the corpses is far better than whoever casted the previous. Ganao can best a demon general in a few quick attacks, or even completely kill a lower demon in one swift strike, depending on how vulnerable the target. Ganao has also been shown to use his wings to fire projectile attacks, launching the hardened Niello feathers at opponents with high velocity. Even with all his big talk, Ganao gives up the perfect opportunity to kill Revolt in order to protect the child, going back on his words towards his partner and, for a moment, admitting to himself he guesses there is weakness inside of him. As series apprentice and first class, Ganao exhibits the standard a top-tier mage should uphold themselves to. Although quite rude and tough to get along with, the man is a strong warrior and powerful mage with a knack for battle. When it comes to some of the higher-ranked people with much more spells and versatility, Ganao, unfortunately, falls short. Yubel, otherwise known as Best Girl, is the first and only third-class mage of the group to skip second grade and move right to a first-class promotion. This is mostly due to Yubel not being ranked correctly by the Continental Association of Magic for reasons we'll be getting into shortly, but as a poor girl born in a poor village, Yubel was raised mostly by her older sister. 
Due to their low income status, Yubel and her family often had to sew their own clothes, but she was never quite good at it. On the other hand, Yubel's sister was a master with fabric. She was able to use scissors and cut through things so smoothly with such a pleasant sound, it left a core memory in Yubel's mind, something that she is able to visualize vividly and clear. And, you know, magic is all about visualization. Yubel's signature spell is known as Real Sadine, a simple magic with one use. Being able to slash almost anything within a 5 meter radius of Yubel's body. Despite being a basic spell, its trajectory is almost impossible to follow by the untrained eye. It can be blocked by defensive magic, but this is because the ability can only be blocked by things Yubel can't imagine herself cutting. Defensive magic is just that, magic that defends. Yubel visualizes the barrier blocking her attack. However, for reasons we'll get into, this ability is special. The true thing holding Yubel back from becoming a second class mage was the situation that involved her disqualification when she took the respective exam. For the final phase, a mage named Berg, the first class proctor of the exam, gave one simple task, cast a spell and force him to take one step backwards. Easy enough. However, Berg was well known for being a renowned defensive magic genius, wearing something he called the immovable cloak that had kept him from ever once being injured since becoming a first class mage. When paired with Yubel, despite every ounce of mana and the multiple different defense and barrier techniques used to craft the cape, not only did Real Satan cut through the immovable cloak, it slashed Berg down the middle, killing him immediately. This is why Yubel, despite only being third class, is vastly underestimated, and this is something that constantly works to her benefit. As someone with a very sly and devilish personality, Yubel isn't afraid to cause trouble or even kill someone that steps out of line. In fact, her introductory scene is a group of bandits descending upon her, thinking Yubel to be a defenseless little girl all alone in the forest. Promptly though, the elf Kraft, a character we met earlier in the series, defeats the bandits and saves Yubel. However, upon further explanation, Kraft admits he was saving the bandits from Yubel, as he came across a pile of sliced up corpses along his path just before and didn't want these criminals to suffer the same fate. Unlike previous mages who are ruthless in a cold way, Yubel is much more playful, enjoying the thrill of battle itself and dragging fights out in order to fully immerse herself in the kill. She isn't completely evil and does have a human side, but even this can be turned on its head to become nefarious for the mage. Yubel has come to believe that a person's specialized magic is something that originates from deep within them being born from a collection of experiences and moments that has crafted the person into who they are today. Her intellectual understanding of magic and the poetic way she's able to trace back the roots of her slashing spell are something that make even a first class mage proctor like sense impressed, considering Yubel a genius and an awful matchup. But this high intellect does more for her than help her get one over on her opponents or stay one step ahead. It also allows her to break down and understand a person's signature spells and then copy them. Essentially, using Yubel's philosophy on magic connecting to a person's most core qualities, Yubel uses what she considers to be empathy to do her best to try and understand her opponents. This is what created her habit of having long drawn out conversations mid battle, not just because of the fact she likes to hear herself talk, but Yubel is able to slowly analyze and recreate a person's signature magic by coming to empathize with them on a legitimate level. For example, in her battle with Werbel, after she is frozen by his binding spell Sorga Neil, Yubel opts to drag out the endgame and ask Warbell about his time at war. Warbell, someone who still tends to hesitate before making a killing blow, despite having killed hundreds of times before this, indulges Yubel, as he doesn't see the harm in this. However, not only does this give Yubel enough time to parse out how Sorganeel works, it allows her to see just the kind of guy Warbell is. And even though Yubel is conniving and full of tricks, the most real thing about her is her condition to copy as Yubel truly must empathize with a mage to steal their move, as shown by her inability to copy her party member land spell because of his standoffish nature. Even though she did break down some walls and gain acquaintanceship with the illusionist, they couldn't truly empathize with each other. Because of this potential to grow unrestrained and copy countless spells of varying levels and elements, Yubel is a serious threat as a mage. 
This skill she has to develop and grow in a moment's notice is made clear by the fact she defeats herself as a clone. Although, this is due in part to Lan creating the opening she needed. Not only was she able to defeat a first class mage proctor during the second phase of the mage exam, during the second phase of the mage exam of current day, Yubel defeats another proctor in the mage sense. Although this is just a clone, Sense seems to believe this outcome would be the same if they were to actually fight as well. And considering these clones are meant to be of equal power, it's definitely not a fluke. Yubel uses her intuition and this quote unquote X factor to justify the risks she takes in battle. This is the reason, despite her self-admitted inexperience, she can tackle seemingly impossible threats. In conclusion on female Sukuna, it's safe to say Yubel is the certified Freerun smoke demon. Her skill for battle and adapting to surpass her opponents in the blink of an eye is commendable and something that will only get better with time. It's also terrifying to think there are even more spells she could have chosen not to show. And a scary question is, what kind of magic does someone that can copy any spell she wants wish for? Introduced into the story as a second class mage, Land is one of the only characters on the list to have passed the mage exam and actually become first class. A very mysterious and quiet individual, Land is paired with Yubel and Fern during the first phase of the exam, but refuses to divulge any information about himself to his teammates, claiming they may be pit against each other in later phases. Land claims to never trust anybody, and this holds true, as no matter how close Yubel attempts to get to him, he ignores or outright refuses her advances even if she is honest in her ulterior motives for the relationship. Going hand in hand with Lan's deceptive personality, the mage is highly adept with illusion magic. Although his signature spell is unknown, the clear level of control and expertise with it is enough to even impress the Great Mage Siri. Using illusions, Lan is able to project clones of himself onto the world that are almost indistinguishable from the real thing. We first see hints of this during Lan's battle with Sharf, a fellow second class mage. When Lan chooses to allow Sharf to gain the upper hand in the fight in order to properly analyze the mage and show all of his hands. Throughout the entire fight, Sharf is unable to tell he's going up against a clone, and this is what ultimately loses him the fight, as the quote unquote real Lan knocks him unconscious from behind once Sharf's guard is down. All damage that Lan's clones take are null and void, as none of them seem to transfer over to the real one. Each clone seems to also hold the same amount of power and mana as the real Lan, leaving no apparent downsides to this spell. Lan can even conjure other fake objects as well, shown when in the second phase of the exam, not only was his injured body fake, his golem escape bottle was also an illusion. Lan can create multiple clones at once, considering he maintains both the injured clone hiding behind the wall and the one Lan creates to help Yubel in battle against her own clone. Despite his apparent coldness and indecision, discriminate nature towards the other mages in the exam, Lan does have some code of honor, which Yubel masterfully perceives through his mysterious facade, as when they are both backed into a corner, Lan neglects to take Yubel's escape bottle and leave her behind. Just from this small comment, Yubel is able to tell Lan is the kind of person who'd hate to be responsible for someone else's death. Lan's relationship with Yubel is interesting, but it seems to mostly stem from her ability to see through Lan's actions. Yubel can also usually expose Lan's clones with her superior magic, but this is actually proven to not be true when the Great Mage Siri, after meeting Lan in the final phase of the exam, gets annoyed he would even try and enter her domain as a clone. Lan tries to play this off and apologize, revealing what he claims to be his true body, but Siri shrugs this off as well, going so far as to say the real Lan never even came to Allburst in the first place. We cut back to the real Lan, sipping tea and relaxing back at his home village. This means that not only are Lan's illusions indistinguishable from the real thing, and not only can he create multiple of them, Lan is able to remotely control all of these illusions from what is assumed to be miles away. 
These illusions are able to transmit battle data or just basic information in general between each other and back to the main body despite the distance. Land is truly an exceptional mage and clearly has plenty more power that we have yet to see. He's one of the characters I'm truly excited to see more of. Land only falls short of a couple people on the list due to not yet seeing his true potential. Being a first class mage, it's also unknown what spell he asked Siri for, meaning Land may have acquired even more power since we last saw him. A young human orphan that was raised by Hyter the priest in his old age and eventually became a highly skilled mage under the tutelage of Freerin the Elf. Originally born in the southern lands of the continent, Fern was set on giving up on life after her parents' death, but thanks to Hyter, she found the resolve to survive and push on while keeping those good memories close. Finding the drive to transform herself into a powerful mage that was able to even impress Freerun in a short amount of time. Due to her upbringing with Hater and having to constantly take care of him, Fern has a very motherly nature about her. Despite the massive age difference, she always finds herself taking care of Freerun as if she were a child. But she also holds this controlling trait over Stark, a warrior in their party who is the same age as her. Although the most grown up member of the party, Fern tends to be childish in the sense she's quick to anger when people don't act the way she wants them to or they neglect the needs she's telepathically sending them. She's a bit high maintenance, but good of heart. Fern is loyal to Freerun and truly respects her guidance, despite not always understanding her master's intentions. She was trained diligently and is well versed on many different aspects of magic and the history of it, leading to her being very level-headed even in dangerous situations and brave enough to tackle challenges she may not always feel she's ready for. Much like Freerun, Fern shares a passion for the pursuit of magic. And because she's Freerun's apprentice, something Fern also shares with her master is mana restriction. To be able to deceive demons and constantly make other mages who detect mana perceive Fern as a lower threat, she is constantly limiting how much mana emanates from her body at all times. However, Fern is able to accomplish this at an unprecedented result, to the point even Freerun herself can have difficulty detecting Fern when she's hiding her mana. This makes Fern almost invisible to other mages, especially demons. On top of Fern's top skill in mana concealment, she is also a master of the flip side, mana detection. To the point, hers may be the most superior sense in the entire world, as not only is Fern able to notice the instability in the Great Mage series mana, a mage who also conceals her mana like Fern and Freerun to deceive demons. Something no one, even series apprentice Lernin, who is one of the best human mages of all time, cannot do. Fern is also the only person to notice Salatara's appearance at the barrier of El Dorado, again, something no one else in the area can feel, not even Freerun or Denkin. This excellence in regards to the basic fundamentals of magic is enough to completely change the Great Mage series' mind on Fern and pass her as a first-class mage. The reason for Fern's top-tier level when it comes to the basics is Freerun's drilling of its importance during their training. Freerun has surmised the absolute best strategy to killing demons or battle in general is efficient mana concealment, detection, and good old-fashioned Zoltrak spam. Zoltrak is the first offensive spell created to pierce a human being and kill them in one large hyperbeam of concentrated mana. Since its inception, about 50 years prior to the current events of the story, humanity has hijacked the spell and altered it to affect demons as well. Freerun's hypothesis on Zoltrak's superiority to any other spell, regardless of humans quote-unquote evolving past Zoltrak and now using elemental or environmental magic, is the fact fact that most demons, their number one priority enemy, haven't completely adapted to humans' usage of Zoltrak. Even Freerun still hasn't developed an instant reflex to defend against the extreme speed mana beam, simply because, to older beings, the spell is technically still new and needs to be adapted to. Whereas a mage like Fern, who has spent her whole life dedicated to learning and honing Zoltrak, is more than capable of not only firing the spell at a higher speed than most demons can react to, she can power it up so highly it could eviscerate them in one cast. Fern has grown to be able to split Zoltrak track into multiple high velocity attacks that can either overwhelm an opponent or even crush them beneath the weight and shatter their barriers. 
The best modification done to the spell is Fern's signature creation, where she conjures a myriad of butterflies made of mana, all highly concentrated castings of Zoltrak, not only charged to maximum output, but fired at high speeds with no loss in power or striking strength. In fact, if Fern's aim was a tad bit better, she holds the ability to completely kill a great demon, shown when she just barely misses Salatar's heart by an inch or two. Obviously, when it comes to full-on battle, a great demon like Salatar was the clear superior fighter, critically wounding both Fern and Stark despite them working together. But even Salatar herself couldn't refuse to acknowledge how impressive Fern was behaving. A top tier first class mage who shows higher potential than almost everyone on this list, it's possible Fern may be the human mage that the great mage Siri predicted to surpass Freerun. Her adeptness in using her quick casting and combining this with an overwhelming intensity of attack power and durability, Fern is a serious threat to handle for any sorcerer. She stood her ground against a great demon, despite being pierced by attacks multiple times, and regardless of how often she lowballs herself, there's a reason Freerun leaves her alone to handle every enemy they encounter. I struggled not placing Fern any higher, especially considering she will no doubt continue to progress as the story continues, but sadly, with some of the power displayed by the mages above her, for now at least, this was the best I could do for Fern. Method is another second turned first class mage after participating in the mage exam with Freerun and the others. The great mage Siri passes Method simply because the only thing on her mind while in front of such a domineering aura is how adorable and cute Siri is. Method is instrumental in the successful assault on all the clones the group of examinees faced during the second phase of the mage exam and later in the Northern Plateau, she depicts a colossal amount of skill in battle and magic as a whole. Method comes from a clan in the Northern region that has dedicated their lives to hunting and slaughtering demons. This is something Method hides very well behind her bubbly and mature personality, doing anything she can to cuddle and pet cute beings like Siri or Freerun, regardless of how annoyed or belittled they may feel about it. She's very different from the other members of her clan, which is a trait that benefits her well on and off the battlefield. Ganao couldn't even begin to sense her strength when being paired with her, and couldn't understand why Siri chose Method instead of someone like Yubel. However, the range of magic Method is capable of speaks for itself. Not only is she a highly intelligent fighter, able to easily deduce an opponent's strengths and weaknesses mid-battle, Method is able to call upon her clan's teachings to easily overwhelm a demon in both sheer volume of magic attacks and even speed, being able to blink behind opponents before they've even realized she's moved. On top of this, the reason Method considers herself a step above most members of her clan is her deep adoration for magic none of them share with her. Because the rest of her family lacks appreciation of the craft, they would never take the time to learn random spells that have nothing to do with battle, such as fog dispelling or hypnotism. Something even more impressive is Method's ability to use the magic of the goddess, a special mana said to only be accessed by priests born with a gift. Method was either always capable of using this type of magic since birth, or somehow found a way to overcome the genetic hurdle. By reading the few translated pages of scripture she had access to, Method is capable of using healing spells. Her recovery magic is at a significant enough level to bring both Stark and Ganao back from death's door after critical injuries, and she's also able to perform autopsies and determine causes of death with this power. A great all-rounded mage with capabilities in offense, defense, healing, and the brain to back it all up with, Method is a very powerful first-class mage. During a fight with a high-tier demon, she didn't even flinch and mostly seemed to be playing with the warrior, much more focused on Fern and making sure she was okay due to her bad matchup. When it was required of her, Method easily turned up the pressure and overwhelmed the demon, and still it was unable to feel killing intent. This was because Method was again multitasking and analyzing the fog to break the spell, so not only was she completely toying with the demon, it wasn't even her main priority. We definitely haven't seen everything that Method is capable of, and considering in the second phase of the mage exam, she was solely responsible for Fern's clone and required no help with defeating it, it's for that reason, despite Fern being nothing short of incredible, I have to assume for all intents and purposes, I gotta rank her higher. 
The oldest person to be able to pass the first class mage exam, Denkin is an imperial mage and a long time participant in the politics of the northern plateau due to his high position. Despite his reputation as a cunning and ruthless politician who ruled with an iron fist, Denkin is actually quite a personable and friendly man. During the first class mage exam, Denkin goes out of his way to be friendly with his party members Richter and Lofen, even well past their team's disbanding. His kindness is also shown in his sternness in demanding Richter not needlessly kill Loween and Kane during their battle. This sternness is a trait of Denkin's leadership. A long time in the Imperial Mages has made Denkin tactful and highly strategic when it comes to battle. He's also not shy to get his hands dirty, shown when he's out of mana and willing to scrap in a fist fight with exam participants in order to accomplish his goal. Denkin is the first person to figure out Freerun's plan to freeze all the water in the first first phase of the exam, and plays around her party's strategy to try and catch them in a trap. With many years on the battlefield and researching magic, Denkin's old age does not hold him back in the slightest when it comes to fighting other mages. The man has an exceptional range in magic attacks and defensive skills, able to create giant tornadoes with the spell Wald Ghost and turn them into hell flames with a spell called Dao Storg. Denkin tends to create this hellfire tornado often, as he also uses it in his battle with Mokht of the Seven Sages. However, Denkin also has highly concentrated spells that hit in extreme speeds, like Katastravia, Lights of Judgment, or, as Freerun always swears by, a good old-fashioned Zoltrak. Although Denkin is strong and battle-hardened, he is very adept when it comes to mana detection as well. He's very aware whenever he's outclassed or fighting a losing battle, however, if this unreachable goal stands between him and his desires, Denkin is the kind of man who will rise to the occasion. In fact, Siri is impressed enough with Denkin to promote him to first class simply because she was able to tell the old man considered having to fight her would be an option. And not many people would even dare to think such a thing. Denkin's bravery is on full display when he fights his former mentor, Mokht, one of the Seven Sages of Destruction. As, despite Mokht being one of the strongest demons in history, Denkin does his best to stay afloat in battle, constantly improving and downloading Mokht's moveset mid-fight, to the point the demon has no choice but to take Denkin seriously. A battle that, despite Denkin being purely outclassed in and essentially is losing most of the time, he's able to bring it to a draw due to Denkin toying with his former master to the very end and hiding his strongest spell for last. As a young child, both of Denkin's parents were killed by demons. He spent his days crying and inconsolable until he was raised by the Lord of the Land Gluk and his assistant, Mokht. Denkin, believe it or not, was trained by the demon Mokht in full confidence, gaining most of his battle skills and spellcasting abilities from one of the strongest mages possible, taking one of the greatest upbringings a mage could ask for and turning it around into military accomplishments. Denkin quickly ascended the ranks of the Imperial Mages in search of power and wealth. This is because Denkin's wife was born frail and sickly, and if Denkin was to be blessed with such power, he should use it to help his wife get the best care possible. Unfortunately, her passing came before Denkin was able to obtain enough resources, meaning he lived the rest of his life immersed in a world of reputation and power that the reason he accrued it all for no longer existed. For decades, Denkin hid from his hometown until eventually it was overtaken by El Dorado's growing curse and only accessible to first-class mages. Considering this his wake-up call, the only reason Denkin took the mage exam in the first place and became acquainted with our protagonist was to visit his wife's grave. And when asking the great mage Siri for any spell he could possibly want, it's the exact magic Denkin will need to fight on even ground with such a powerful demon like Mach. Denkin learns from Siri the spell Mistilzla, curse reversal magic that normally takes 100 years to learn. A first class mage in more than just title, but pure character, the power behind a person like Denkin is massive, and the multiple years of on the ground experience, including a demon mentor, easily explain how an old man could reach such a high level of strength. I don't think it's hard to see why Denkin would rank above most other characters on the list. However, I'm sure once they reach his age, they'll be able to give him a run for his money. The fifth top mage in Freerun. Sense is the proctor of the second phase of the first class mage exam, and one of the most powerful and closest mages to Ciri's side. Despite her strength, 
She considers herself a pacifist, even going so far as to chastise her fellow Proctor Ganau for being so willing to discard exam participants' lives in his phase of the test. Ironically enough, Sense can be deemed just as cruel in her examination methods. In some instances, she may come off as even tougher on her participants, almost always creating second phases to the exam that are next to impossible to pass, even for those mages that might actually be first-class material. Personality-wise, Sense is a quiet individual, a woman of few words, but many thoughts. Edel, just from a glance at the way she carries herself, comes to the conclusion Sense has a higher than average intelligence and therefore a super imagination. And as I've said multiple times already, visualization is key in becoming a top class mage. Sense's signature spell is unknown in name, but it allows her to course layers upon layers of mana throughout every individual strand of hair she carries in her long flowing mane. She is able to manipulate every thread to create a myriad of different attacks and defensive strategies, stemming from Sense's ability to easily visualize controlling her hair in all different shapes and sizes. The plain aura of her clone alone walking through the halls of the ruins of the king's tomb is enough to bring terror and thoughts of failure into every mage in the second phase of the exam. Except Yubel, of course. This fear is justifiably placed, as from the short scuffles we do see her get into, not only is she able to use her hair to slip past enemy defense, but she can pack on strength similar to a boulder to smash through barrier spells. Three mages could barely last 15 seconds in a fight with Sense's clone, and despite them hiding their mana to the best of their ability, her mana detection was keen enough to find their hiding place with little time passing between. Unfortunately, we haven't seen much from Sense yet, but if strong mages like Denkin or Fern can't visualize beating her, well, then frankly, there's gotta be something there. Just barely pushing her past those two into rank number five. The oldest and very first mage to be promoted to first class in the Continental Association of Magic's history, as Great Mage Series' longest living and most distinguished apprentice, not including Flam, of course. Lernin lives up to his reputation as one of the most powerful magic users on the continent. Siri has entrusted him with hosting the third and final phase of the first class mage exam, which is normally even harder than the prior tasks. This year was different, of course, due to the passing of so many mages in the second phase. Although his signature spell is unknown, the amount of skill he's shown with magic fundamentals is superior to any on the list before him. Lernin is the first and only person in millennia to notice the instability in Freerin's mana, something only done once before ever by the Demon King. Not only are his senses at their peak, but even simple offensive magic is as well. Lernin's Zoltrak was capable of blitzing through Freerin's defense barrier and causing injury, something even a high power mage like Denkin couldn't accomplish. This attack was casted before any duel had officially begun, but it's impressive to consider Freerun wasn't completely off guard here. Lernin does seem to have a fascination with golem creation, being responsible for making the escape golems used in the second phase of the mage exam, so it's possible his signature ability revolves around this. Considering what we know from Yubel about core desires being responsible for one specialization, regardless, Lernin outclasses almost anyone on the list and may have even forced Freerun's hand in battle had their duel been allowed to continue. As a young child, Lernin was always outwardly timid and submissive. His inability to socialize well ended up with him getting kicked out of the Imperial Mages, although he did manage to make a great, long-lasting friendship with Denkin during this time. After becoming the Great Mage Ciri's apprentice and the first ever First Class Mage, Lernin trained under Ciri and grew his skills past anything any Imperial Mage could have imagined. Lernin comes to deeply care for and appreciate his mentor, and his only regret in life is being born during an era of peace and not being able to leave his mark in history on the battlefield as Ciri's apprentice. It's this inability to show the fruits of Ciri's labor to the world that leads Lernin to cast aside formalities and challenge Freerun to a duel of his own accord. However, upon learning from Freerun that Ciri, in her own special way, appreciates and remembers every single apprentice she takes, 
he learns to accept his place in the world. This is, however, a quick glance into Lernan's secret rebellious side. Also shown, he defies Ciri's wishes in El Dorado and interrupts her battle with the strongest Sage of Destruction, Mocked, inadvertently saving Mocked's life and convincing the Great Mage to seal the demon instead of killing him in order to one day undo all the people Mocked has turned to gold. And later on, Lernan again shows his excellence in magic by facing off against Mock himself during current day not giving off enough aura to threaten the demon, and only fighting in a way such to annoy the sage. In this quick shuffle, he does show extreme speed, reflexes, and the ability to swarm an opponent with offensive spells, and even defend a full power swing from Mach with his barrier. Although outclassed, Lernan admits he's never lost a battle to buy time, and at the very least, does outsmart Mocked by giving Edel an opening to steal his memories. Lernan then shows his final hand by escaping Mocked after all of this, displaying even more powerful, more colossal golems at his disposal, shaped like a giant knight that acts as a distraction. This whole entire scene is just an implication that, despite his old age, in battle, Lernan truly opens up and becomes his true self. A playful, trickster type mage that unfortunately was past his prime by the time we get to meet him. Still, even with that, rank 4 on the stack list is very impressive. Known as the Great Mage Flom, she is Freerun's mentor, the student of the Great Mage Siri, and one of the most famous mages in history, despite the passing of thousands of years since her death. One day, coming upon an elven village that was slaughtered by demons, the great mage Flom found an orphaned Freerun by herself. The young elf, despite being a mere child, was able to murder all of the demons in revenge, as well as a top-tier demon named Basalt, one of the generals in the Demon King's army. Flom compliments Freerun for this, but admits it was a stupid move and would have been smarter to flee. Flom claims this is just another reason she doesn't understand strong mages, which confuses Freerun as she's able to sense even greater power in Flom than herself, something that piques Flom's interest. She is able to empathize with Freerun's hatred of demons and admits to sharing those feelings, calling the entire species of demons cunning yet cowardly all the same. It's for this reason Flom chooses to deceive demons as a way of life, killing any she comes across by taking advantage of their senseless pride. She does this by constantly limiting her mana all the time around the clock for her entire life consistently tricking most, if not all, enemy mages that oppose her into underestimating her. Because, as far as they can tell, all they sense is a low-level mage. Flom claims that demons would never even think to limit their mana, due to a need to flex their powers at all times, even amongst companions. A flaw that allows a trick like mana concealment to work against demons every single time. The great mage Flom is actually one of the most powerful mages to ever live, and unfortunately, we only get one instance of her massive power, where she saves young Freerun from the demons pursuing them. In an instant, Flom blows the entire area apart, creating a large crater that leaves not a single trace of the demons that were hit by the blast. Despite Flom's overwhelming power, and what Freewin claims to be a constant need to play her like a fiddle, she is ultimately a very wise and kind individual, able to accurately predict one day in Freewin's long life she'll realize she made a mistake and return to someone Freewin's loss in an attempt to understand them, despite it being too late. This foreshadowing goes even further when you consider the journey Freerun is currently on with Fern and Stark was also predicted by Flom, seeing as she left instructions for Freerun to locate her in the afterlife in a plant she enchanted long before her death. Comically, Flom is even able to stay one step ahead of Ciri herself, despite being the student in their relationship, accurately telling Freerun that Ciri would be infuriated by Flom's request to start the Continental Magic Association and tear up her will, which is exactly what happens. Flom's dream was to bring magic to every human in the continent, so she spent much of her short human life fighting to make it something accepted in everyday life. When Flom was young, Due to the Demon King's terrible reign, most magic was deemed taboo and was forbidden to research. Something that upset Flom, as she truly loved magic and the beauty that it was able to bring to the world. This is proved by the fact that, despite being an all-powerful mage capable of massive destruction, out of every spell Flom knew, her favorite was one that made a field of flowers. 
She was found by the great mage Ciri as a young child and taken in as her apprentice off a hunch, which proved to be right. As not only did Flom spread magic across the continent, she managed to convince the Emperor to invest in creating new mages everywhere and establish a new order of Imperial Mages. In the grand scheme of things, this ushered in a new era where man was finally able to fight on equal ground against the Demon King and his forces, making Flom remembered across time as the founder of mankind's magic. As Freerun depicts time and time again though, True history is lost to exaggerations and agendas of victors, as most of Flom's statues or memorials usually are crafted in the shape of a man or someone that looked nothing like the original. Regardless, Flom's impact on humanity and the world is unable to be ignored. Although we don't know much, it's easy to tell she would still outclass almost all modern mages. According to Flom though, what made both her and Ciri unable to defeat the Demon King was their inability to visualize a peaceful future. This is what always separated those two from Freerun and made her the mage destined to conquer the great evil. The main protagonist of the series, an elf that has lived for over 1,000 years and is famous throughout the world for being the mage in the party of heroes that slayed the Demon King, suffering from the massive weight of living for thousands of years and outgrowing any other life forms around her, despite Freerun's polite and friendly nature, she tends to be a bit disconnected. Freerun is aware most humans around her won't last for long, and because of this different perception of time, she finds it hard to understand people. Even with 10 years of journeying with the party of heroes, Freerun felt like she barely knew them. Because of this altered sense of time, Freerun tends to have a very lackadaisical attitude, sleeping in often, getting lost in long tasks that may take months or even years simply because it's a blink of an eye for her. Her deep fascination and love for magic and all magic items makes her hard to reel in, especially when it comes to dungeon treasure or towns with a lot of magic shops. Most of the current party's journey consists of Freerun and friends performing odd jobs for grimoires of spells some might consider useless or have no grand value. However, most of this is due to Freerun's drive to attempt to understand humans in this phase of her life. After a reflection on her time with the party of heroes, she feels like she missed out on truly getting to know the people around her. Only as they slowly died one by one to old age did she set out to meet them and realize her mistake. It's because of this, Freerun, despite always liking to travel alone so she can truly take her time, decides to take on Fern as an apprentice and add Stark as their warrior. As she spends more time with them, not only can she reflect on great memories with her old party and come to understand things that may have been lost on her earlier, Freerun even begins hastening her pace as she wants to ensure her and her new party make the most of the time they have. When Ganal learns Freerun has a holy emblem during the first class mage exam, he refers to Freerun as the last great mage, which is truly an understatement when describing Freerun. Again, an elf that has lived for 1,000 years, not only has Freerun had the chance to hone her skills to the maximum, she had amazing guidance through her mentor Flom. As we discussed before, the great mage Flom encouraged Freerun's pursuit of magic and was the one who taught her the method of mana concealment we see Freerun continue to impart on Fern today. Being the student of the human mage who revolutionized magic for all of humanity leads to Freerun excelling in plenty of different aspects when it comes to spell casting and mana control. One of the most important aspects to Freerun as a mage is her ability to learn and adapt mid-battle and handle most if not all situations intelligently and with a level head. Much like other high-class mages and demons, her brain is easily able to fight and cast high-level spells simultaneously whilst analyzing an opponent's magical barrier or area of effect spell. However, Freerun's ability to deconstruct another person's creations are unreplicatable. In one whole day, Freerun was able to analyze the Great Mage series barrier for the exam location and use her mana to shatter it into pieces. A feat that Ganau, the first phase proctor, had deemed impossible, considering Ciri's superior mana. Freerun is also able to completely parse through 100 years of Mox memories in order to learn how to dispel his Dia Gold spell, something even the original caster Mocked was unable to conceive. Doing something that no mage or demon could accomplish in almost a century 
Considering Freerin, when her mana concealment is turned off and all restrictions removed, carries with her a stock of mana that is so massive it was enough to completely outweigh Aura, a demon in the Seven Sages of Destruction who had reigned for hundreds of years. There has been no mage to ever overcome a demon of that level in mana alone, at least not that we've seen yet. And these monsters aren't pushovers. There's a reason they survived well past the reign of the Demon King. Although Freerun is able to fight on par with great demon level warriors like Solitar or Mokht, she is noticeably on the back foot in most of these encounters. Solitar is able to wound Freerun multiple times in their fight and shatter her defensive barriers with both her swords and concentrated mana bursts. Mokht is also able to use his golden blade to rip through Freerun's defenses as well, to the point even now she's unconfident if she could win in a fight against him. Granted, Mokht is the strongest Sage of Destruction, and Solitar is a complete anomaly in the demon hierarchy that Freerun does ultimately triumph over, but it's clear this is Freerun's ceiling of strength at the moment. Regardless, achieving a level of magical power of that height puts Freerun on a pedestal higher than most human mages with their short lifespan could ever hope to reach. Freerun has displayed only a minuscule of her true power in the series so far, as displayed by her secret ability that was almost unveiled against Fern in the second phase of the Mage Exam. Freerun has shown the use of strong offensive spells like Judra Jim, Destructive Lightning, or Volzon Bell, Hellfire Summoning, which are devastating attacks that cover a large range of space and can easily rip through defensive skills if not properly blocked against. Zoltrak is also a common spell in Freerun's arsenal, as she knows better than anyone, because of its somewhat new introduction to the world of magic, a lot of older mages and demons like her aren't able to respond and defend to it as quickly as other attacks. Freerun has shown more than enough destructive power to obliterate her own self with a point-blank attack spell, and when that doesn't work, her high battle IQ helps her adapt mid-fight. Freerun's understanding of the fundamentals, just like Fern, allows her to mold her fighting style into whatever is needed at the time, to the point she can even learn new spells on the fly if given enough information. Shown when Freerun pulls a straight Goku against Salatar and copies her mana burst within little to no time at all. In the second phase of the Mage Exam, when pushed against the wall, the clone of Freerun also unveiled some kind of crazy force attack that was enough to completely cripple Fern, snap her stave beyond beyond repair, and almost crush her under the weight had real Freerun not landed the killing blow while her guard was down. So there are even more hidden powers and spells Freerun has yet to unveil. As she tells Fern, it's been years since someone's made her bring that technique out. Still though, regardless of Freerun being one of the most powerful mages in the series, she still, like everyone else, has her flaws. She counts herself as one of the older mages that Zoltrak still catches off guard due to not having the ingrained reflex of defending it just yet, and surprisingly, Freerun also shares a very similar mistake to a lot of rookie mages, where their mana detection falls flat for a moment in the middle of casting an attack spell, literally a weakness that kept Sharf all the way down at the bottom, which is crazy when you think about it. But because Freerun is so overwhelmingly powerful, something as minuscule as that doesn't affect her performance in battle unless she's up against a similar threat level. Elves, when mages, are always going to have the advantage of time against humans, as they have thousands of years to sharpen their edges and mold themselves into top tier threats. And this goes especially for our number one mage. The head of the Continental Magic Association and an elven mage of over 1,000 years who claims to be a great mage from the quote unquote mythical era. Ciri is a somewhat cold, self serving individual who, despite being called a living grimoire and supposedly knowing every single spell in history, still considers magic as a mere tool for killing. She chastises her own apprentice Flom, and even Flom's apprentice Freerun for their childish views on pursuing magic, claiming it lacks purpose and idealism. Despite this, Ciri isn't close-minded enough to see an aspiring mage with drive when she sees one, as even when first meeting the great mage Flom as a child and finding it laughable her favorite spell was creating a field of flowers, Ciri still took the human as an apprentice. Even if she doesn't agree with the ambition, potential as a mage is something Ciri refuses to ignore. It's why, no matter how much she hates losing human apprentices to time, she refuses to stop taking them. The great mage 
age, Siri, much like Freerun, has a very disconnected personality due to her longer than average lifespan. It's because of this, outwardly, Siri displays little care for those around her. Even one of her greatest apprentices, Flom, who achieved her dream of spreading magic to all of humanity, is someone she speaks coldly of in memory. Ironically, Freerun notes how Siri will never forget each of her apprentice's favorite spells, no matter how much time goes by, implying a heart of gold beneath that cold exterior. This is something that Freerun and Flom before her are easily able to see through and play around even. Shown when Freerun is more than aware Siri will fail her for the exam, but will not fail Fern, as even though Fern completely contradicts everything Siri thinks a maid should stand for, we can thank Freerun for that. Once Fern detects the instability in Siri's mana, something no human has ever done in history, Siri can't bring herself to hold back a mage like Fern's progress passing her on the spot. As a great mage from the mythical era, Ciri possesses such a vast amount of mana, it's actually unknown how high her ceiling could possibly be. We just got done explaining how both Flom and Freerun have spent their lives limiting their mana in order to deceive demons. However, shown by Freerun, when that limit is released, the true stock of mana hidden beneath this restraint is unbelievable. A massive ocean of power that exceeds even a demonic sage of destruction. When you consider that Freerun, unrestrained, still doesn't even compare to the great mage Siri, while restrained, pure insanity. Ciri's extensive knowledge of magic and all of the spells in history make her one of the strongest beings in the entire world, maybe behind only the Demon King an enemy she could not defeat. And with the spell Fear Velia, Siri can impart any piece of that knowledge onto a mage that passes the first class exam as a gift, with the power to actually create grimoires from scratch for the cost of forgetting that spell. Even spells that require hundreds of years of training can be learned in an instant. And this is why Siri is called the Living Grimoire. Unfortunately, we don't know too much about Siri, but we have enough context clues to understand why she's number one on this list at least. We only get to see her fight once against Mach, the strongest of the Seven Sages of Destruction. After Mach turns the entire city of El Dorado into gold, Siri, using her ability to hide mana, immediately puts herself in killing range of Mach's back. Not only does he admit to not being able to sense her, in moments, Siri is able to trick him into revealing he has no idea how to return everyone back from gold. Just by threatening his life and not getting an answer, Siri was able to deduce all of that. She's also in complete control of the encounter, as Mocked is at Siri's mercy entirely. Every attack he makes, she either blocks with little effort or redirects. Using the spell Mistelzla, a curse reversal magic to counter Mocked's Diagolds, the spell that turns people into gold, right back onto him. Mocked a demon that even gave Freerun a problem, and someone she would have preferred not to take on, would have been eliminated on the spot by Siri here if Lernin did not interfere and beg her to try and seal Mocked instead. Despite claiming boredom here and not caring what happens, the immense trust Siri has in Lernin is shown considering she acknowledges how much death could come from keeping Mocked alive. I still appreciate Siri's character a lot and wanted to discuss everything available in regards to her strength level. I can't wait to see where she fits into this whole story. And again, I don't think it's controversial to say she definitely fits here as the strongest mage to be picked. If you made it this far into the video, thank you so much for watching. I sincerely appreciate it. Make sure you hit the like button if you enjoyed that content. And if you want to see more videos like this, please consider hitting the subscribe button. Hit an end screen video if you'd like to continue your binge. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.